National Congress, viva! Viva! Viva SACP, viva! Viva! Viva SACP, viva! Viva! Viva Kosatu, viva! Viva! Viva Sanko, viva! Viva! Long live the spirit of Chris Hani, long live! Long live! Long live the spirit of Nelson Mandela, long live! Long live! Long live the spirit of Raymond Mshaba, long live! Long live the spirit of Walter Sisulu, long live. Long live. Long live the spirit of John Gomomo, long live. Long live. Long live the spirit of Wongankala, long live. Long live. Long live the spirit of Wisile Tole, long live. Long live. Long live the spirit of Jeff Wabani, long live. Long live. Mantla. Comrades. They have wheel balapa. It's a real pleasure. They have bule loguti niye nang ting uguti ning invite ngi zobalapa. The police say amakabani in kokeli the SACP. The police say in kokeli the African National Congress at all levels. The bully is a fool, Tinko Kelly, the Sanko, Naze Kosatu, and all other organizations and formations. Information says, Fanane, ANC Youth League, No Mama, ANC Women's League. Mangongwe. <laughs> Comrades. Oh, comrades, Ben Zaydwen, for me. They took me to the home of Umama Oshile Umamu Landani. Lindani. She was 107 years old. But the most important and significant thing is that she was still a member of the African National Congress. And I informed our comrades, Pai Kayen Uguti, this is really history in the making. I have never heard of anyone who is a member of the African National Congress who is 107 years old. So today, Itinake has made history, and I inform the Comrades Good Day, Secretary General, Ogoti Apale Inwati, for to keep a certificate of recognition. Ogoti Mama was the oldest member of the ANC in the history of the ANC. But more importantly, she is the only person that we know who is older than our glorious movement, the African National Congress. So we salute her and we recognize her for her unbelievable loyalty to the African National Congress over all these years. Comrades Tibana Apa, to remember a leader of our movement, Comrade Chris Hahn a great son of the soil of our country. We are also here to express our deep feelings towards one who was among the most admired, amongst the most beloved, 
Kalogu Chris Hani was probably the most loved ANC leader at the time when he was killed. And his affection to our people remains. Usatandwa, u Chris Hani, bayatanda, oganyabatandi. He is still loved by our people. But more importantly, he was also an extraordinary revolutionary. He was one of those people who was liked immediately. No comrade Chris Hani, you couldn't but be affected by his warmth, by his approachability, he was one of those leaders who was immediately approachable. And he was one of those leaders who was very simple. Simple in the sense that his character was a very natural character. And he had a very warm, comradely attitude. Wayanga fanina la manyama comrade. Eswa bonayo these days. Abas patela pezulu. Oti no kaufuru teta nae. Tolukuti awazukum approacha. Because maybe Sebas Bonela Bene Pezulu and their noses are up in the air because of the positions they occupy. And his personality was original. And even if you hadn't learned anything about Kumrit Chris Hani, you were immediately impressed and affected by his outstanding virtues. And we are meeting here, comrades, to recall the enormous contribution that was made to the struggle of our people by Comrade Chris Hahn. And he is one of those who dedicated himself to the freedom of our people in an unbelievable way. We remember how kind he was, his selflessness, his modesty, his intellect, and his unbelievable courage. And his personality was made up by virtues that are rarely found today. You can look around today and it will be very rare to find an outstanding leader like Comrade Chris Hahn. They to Nahaba throughout the country, you will not be able to find easily a great leader like him. He stood out as an unsurpassed person of action, but he was also the type of leader who had visionary intelligence. He was a man of ideas and Good ideas, i.e. ideas as Bolileo. He did not have rotten ideas. He had the best ideas and absolute great intelligence. And he was a profound thinker. He was a man who had amazing attributes. And he was able to combine these amazing attributes and combined them in himself, he had integrity, a person of high honor, of absolute sincerity, and a person whose conduct did not have a single stain. Comrade Chris Hani, why Nazo is scandals. He was a scandal-free leader of our people. But he was also those who served in the People's Army. He was also an outstanding soldier, a very courageous soldier, a disciplined cadre of our movement. And, but the most important comrades, Comrade Chris Hani was the type of leader who put the interests of the people first above his own interests. He did not allow himself to be captured by other interests. 
He was only captured by the African National Congress and the struggle of our people. And so therefore, he always put the safety of our people before his own. He was a revolutionary who was truly worthy of being awarded Isitwala and Siaparangwe. And he was a giant of our struggle who has rightly earned his place among the most outstanding leaders of our people like Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, Gavin Beke, Oliver Tambo, Moses Kotani, Lillian Boy, Dorothy Nyembe, Joe Slovo, and Ahmed Kathrada. That is the league in which Ukris Hani operated, and he walked in that league. And I'm sure wherever he is now, he is with those giants of our revolution, conversing and looking at our situation and wondering what he says and doing now. Why are we messing up this movement and why are we messing up this country? And that is why, comrades, when we talk about Chris Hani, we think of his life, when we think of his conduct in relation to his com a commitment to the struggle, we think of him and the extraordinary human being that he was. And he was the type of person who was able to unite in his personality not only the characteristics of the man of action, but also the man of ideas as to be counted amongst the most and the best leaders in our country that the movement has produced. Such great attributes which his movement instilled in him, which his movement bestowed in him, were outstanding attributes. He was molded and perfected by the African National Congress and his party, the SACP. As we gather here, comrades, we recall also with great deal of anguish and sorrow the horrific act of racial hatred that ended his life on the eve of our freedom. For the masses of our people, this was the darkest moment before the democratic dawn. The heart of our nation had been pierced and ripped apart and was bleeding as he was killed. And his assassination resounded throughout the world. His killers had hoped that the assassination would so destabilize the negotiation process and would shut our way and our path to freedom. What stopped South Africa from descending comrades into civil war after his assassination was the manner in which the African National Congress, its leadership, was able to give leadership to the country and the way in which Comrade Nelson Mandela addressed the nation at the most critical, trying, and dangerous hour in the history of our country. <laughs> Madiba, comrades, I'd like us to remember what Madiba said because it's important that we should have a memory of the times that we lived through and how your movement, your organization, the African National Congress and the whole alliance were able to steer our country through very stormy waters. Madiba said when he went to address the nation, at that time we were still on the outside, and the National Party and their friends were on the inside, and it was unheard of 
for a leader of the ANC to go and address the nation on television. But this time, because and following the assassination of Comrade Chris Hani, the country was on a knife edge. And they agreed that the only way in which to tilt the country backwards to normality would be for Madiba, Comrade Madiba, to address the nation. And he said, today an unforgivable crime has been committed. A white man full of prejudice and hate came to our country and committed a deed so foul that our whole nation now tatters on the brink of disaster. He continued, a white woman of Africana origin risked her life so that we may know and bring to justice this assassin. And he said, our decisions and action will determine whether we use our pain, our grief, and our outrage to move forward to what is on the only lasting solution to our country, an elected government of the people and for the people. We must not let the man who worships war and who lusts after blood to precipitate actions that will plunge our country into the precipice. It was at that moment that power, state power, literally shifted. It passed from Utiklek to Umadiba. That is when Ukomred Nelson Mandela effectively became the de facto president of South Africa even before the elections happened. Rather than scuppering negotiations, the process of negotiations was sped up. And we insisted that following the assassination of Comrade Chris Hani, the only way to keep this country from getting into disaster was to set a date for elections. At that time, at that time, the apartheid rulers of this country did not want to set a date for elections. And we kept on saying, let us set a date for elections so that everybody then begins to work towards that date. And comrade, I can tell you without any hesitation, Ogoti, comrade Chris Hani's death was the one thing that triggered the setting of a date for elections when we set the date to be the 27th of April 1994. That is the sacrifice that Comrade Chris Hani made so that we can have a date for elections. In a way, our Freedom Day, which is coming in a few days, is inextricably linked with the memory of Comrade Chris Hani, and it is an apt thing to be holding these memorial lectures at a time between his assassination as well as the date of our elections. It is fitting that as we celebrate the contribution of Isitola and Chris Hani, we reflect on the revolutionary tasks that we must still undertake to achieve that freedom that Comrade Chris Hani sacrificed so much for. We must reflect on the work that we all still need to do to liberate all our people from all forms of oppression and exploitation. It is fitting that we reflect on how the life contribution and character of Comrade Chris Hani provided and can continue to provide a guide to how we approach the responsibilities we must now shoulder together. I've often asked myself a number of questions. What would we do? What would Comrade Chris Hani have done at this point in time 
in the life of the politics of our country. I'm sure each one of us will come with a number of answers. Because the Amaz, the Comrade Chris Hani, he was brave, he was forthright, and he was a direct talker. It is fitting, particularly at a time like this, when our movement is going through challenging times, to reflect on what kind of a leader he was. Comrade Chris Hani was a unifier. He was a nation builder. He was committed to ensuring that the African National Congress, the SACP and the entire alliance remained united. He was a champion of non-racial and non-sexist South Africa, deeply committed to breaking down the barriers that had long kept our people apart. He was not the kind of leader, comrades, who through reckless statements and self-serving actions would divide the movement of our people and polarize the nation. Chris Harney was not like that. He was a unifier and a builder. He embodied the revolutionary qualities that we need in our leaders today. He was the kind of leader that we speak about in the document through the eye of the needle when we say a leader should constantly seek to improve his capacity to serve the people. He should strive to be in touch with the people at all times. Listen to their views and learn from them. He should be accessible and flexible and not arrogate to himself the status of being the source of all wisdom. A person who says, I have all the answers. A leader should win the confidence of the people in the day-to-day -day work. In his day-to-day -day work, where the situation demands, he should be or she should be firm and have the courage to explain and seek to convince others of the correctness and the decisions taken by the various structures of the movement even, those, even though, if those decisions are unpopular, they should not seek to gain cheap popularity by avoiding difficult issues, making false promises, or making pandering or popular sentiment. Okumre Chris Hani was deeply rooted amongst the masses, and he was a person who was willing to listen who was not afraid to confront problems. He was also not afraid, comrades, to raise concerns about the state of the movement and the conduct of its leaders. He was able to clearly articulate the weaknesses in our strategy or the shortcomings in the implementation of our strategy. And he did so precisely so that we could correct our errors and build the movement as a stronger, more effective instrument of our struggle. He did so not to divide the African National Congress, but to unite it around a common understanding of the tasks of the moment as well as the actions that needs to be taken. Comrade Chris, for him, critical, honest debate was a necessary condition for unity. And organizational renewal was a necessary condition of progress. Namtanje, there are comrades and leaders of our movement who say that there are certain things that we must not talk about. There are certain things that should not be talked about. Ukumbed Chris Hani would have gone precisely against that because he was one person who always believed in debate and in discussion. Early in 1969, 
Comrade Chris and six other members of Mkonte Wesizwe produced a document that became known as the Honey Memorandum. It began saying, the ANC in exile is in deep crisis as a result of which a rot has set in. From informal discussions with the revolutionary members of MK, we have inferred that they have lost all confidence in the ANC leadership abroad. This they say openly, and in fact, they don't only say it, they also show it. Such a situation is very serious, and in fact, a revolutionary moment movement rather, has to sit down and analyze such a prevailing state of affairs. That is what Comrade Chris Hani and his other comrades wrote. Right now, comrades, there are many within us, within the Alliance, yes, within the SACP, within COSATU, yes, within the African National Congress itself, as well as the broader democratic movement who say that the ANC is today in a deep crisis. That is what they are saying. Many say that a rot has set in, a result of our inability to respond effectively to the challenges and the temptations of political office. While some may want to contest the use of a crisis because those who are denialists, those who are behaving like ostriches, hiding their head in the sand, Bazaouti, there is no crisis. And yet there is a crisis. And yet rot has set in into our organization. The undeniable reality, comrades, is that the democratic movement, our movement, is undergoing a period of greater turbulence and uncertainty than at any time since 1994. There is a strong sense amongst many of our people that the ANC no longer represents they are hope for a better life and a better future. Many believe that the ANC is no longer a trusted repository of the aspirations of our people for freedom, dignity, peace, justice, good governance, and so forth. Recent political developments have thrown into sharp focus the divisions within our movement. And they have brought to the fore a lot of broader grievances about the direction of the country. The manner and the form recently in which the cabinet was reshuffled a few weeks ago heightened those tensions within the, the movement. Whether we want to dismiss it or not, the reality is that triggered the heightening of those tensions. Causing some comrades to engage in bitter exchanges in public statements and on social media. It has further polarized the alliance and broader democratic movement with different formations taking strongly opposing positions. But there is a broader problem. Then there are the problem in all comrades. Over many years, the unity of the democratic movement has been gradually eroded as the politics of patronage, factionalism, vote buying, gatekeeping has become widespread. We, have now, we are now in an era, and comrades don't want us to talk about this, but 
hey, the African National Congress is the parliament of the people, and we must talk about these things. We cannot keep quiet. As far as the because in order for us to find solutions, and I will be suggesting some solutions, in order for us to find solutions, we must do a diagnosis. Spanish would say the soul and away to we must diagnose ourselves and find out what is the problem. The problem is money. Imali is Luis Amaj. Money has come in between us. And today there is patronage, there is money that is being passed around in bags and paper bags, the brown envelope has become a big thing in our movement today. As we are leading to the conference, money has started being the currency of gate buying favor and votes. That is already happening. In many parts of our, of our country, the interests of the people have been rendered subordinate to the interests of the few as they jostle for positions of authority and access to resources. This comrades, this challenge has been identified as the highest level, at the highest levels of our movement. Resolutions, remember, have been taken at successive national conferences, successive NGCs, and it has been debated endlessly in the alliance. Yet it continues to be a problem that besets our organization and it diminishes our ability to realize our objective to achieve a better life for the people of our country. The challenge, comrades, that faces each and every member of the ANC, the Alliance and the broader democratic movement, is what should we do about this? What should we do about this cancer that has found its way into the body of our movement? How should we respond to the many challenges that today confront our revolution? The lesson from the life and struggle of Chris Harney, and the lesson from the Chris Harney Memorandum in particular, is that we must honestly and directly own up to the problem. We must say, comrades, we have a problem. We must do so in an effort to achieve some kind of solution finding. We must do so not to divide the organization or to demoralize the membership of our movement. We must do so because that is what a revolutionary movement does. When a revolutionary movement diagnoses itself and finds that there are problems, it sits down and talks honestly about the problems. Once we have analyzed these challenges, and once we have a common understanding of what the causes and the manifestations of these problems are, then we are then able to take concrete action. And we must do so together. As former president of the ANC, Corporate Oliver Tambo said in 1980, the need for unity of the patriotic and democratic forces of our country has never been greater than it is today. Our unity has to be based on honesty amongst ourselves, the courage to face reality, adherence to what has been agreed upon and to principle. These words that were spoken by Comrade O.R. Tambo over three decades ago perfectly capture the central task of the democratic movement at this very difficult moment in our history. Comrade Chris Hani 
would have been the first to say that we need to be honest amongst ourselves. Old Setinyani amongst ourselves. The ANC comrades cannot fulfill its historic mission if it is divided. It divisions in our ranks. The factions that have formed within our ranks make the ANC weaker. It has a responsibility not only to be united itself, but to unite society behind the program of fundamental and economic, social and economic change. This has been its central strength over many decades of struggle. First, in defeating the apartheid, and then in building a new democratic state that has had significant successes in improving the lives of our people. However, comrades, its ability to unite society has become significantly diminished. The ANC used to be seen as the leader of society. We provided leadership on any issue and every issue in the country. The ANC was the go-to organization. Even if you were not a member, you wanted to go and hear what the ANC says. If we are to be honest with ourselves, our movement, the ANC, has lost that position. We are no longer the leaders of society. Society is walking away from us. And the divisions within the organization and amongst leaders are well ventilated in the public space. We are an organization that is riddled with factions. Despite the good work that continues to be done by cadres and employees in various spheres, the ANC's program in government and in communities lacks that sufficient coherence and focus. The allegations, and these allegations, comrades, are so plentiful. The allegations that there are private individuals who exercise undue influence over state appointments and procurement decisions should be a matter of great concern to our movement. Allegations that there are families that exercise so much power. And one of those families, I was saying, Paya and Lady, you where I went to greet Omunye Uta Tawa Paya and Lady, Uti, Uti Gum no, Ut Deputy, what no, I'm not busy with Deputy, the Miss President, that you. Thousands and jalo, who's our dance of what he defined in Umtebis. Umtebis. Umtebis, he was offered the position of Minister of Finance. Bamniga ni mali. Wala. What I had the full position. Correctly so. Namsha do kotiyu. So Comrades, but more seriously, more seriously, these practices, these practices where you have a sense of what decisions are taken elsewhere. They threaten the integrity of the state. They undermine our economic progress and diminish our ability to change the lives of our people. More importantly, these activities also threaten the cohesion of our movement and our unity. They simply destroy trust. Well, once these things start manifesting this, themselves as such a ban, we no longer trust each other. These activities, if left unchecked, could 
will destroy our revolution. It is therefore critical, comrades, that the allegations of state capture should be put to rest. Go over the state capture. A city, city kaitetongai openly. We talk about it quietly. We gossip about it. We know what it is an elephant in the room, but as full of tetangai on the elephant. We don't want to talk about this elephant. But we know what he called. Now we are saying we need to put this to rest. And we do so. We should do so from an organizational point of view. We should do so to safeguard the unity of our organization. We should do so to safeguard the cohesion of our organization so that if there is any wrongdoing, it must be exposed and if there are strange practices, they must be brought to an end. I think we should be honest and brave enough to confront them. The ANC, therefore, must, should support the establishment of an effective, credible mechanism to investigate these claims. And the Judicial Commission has, of inquiry has been suggested. I support that oh, there should be a Judicial Commission of Inquiry. Each of them. It is possibly the only process that will be able to go to the bottom of these allegations and determine the truthfulness or lack thereof. But then we need a process so that we stop gossiping, so that we stop talking in quiet corners about these matters. And this is where the honesty of Comrade Chris Hani comes to the fore. This is the honesty that O.R. Tambo spoke about. We should not be afraid of the truth because in the end, comrades, it is the truth that will set us free. It is the truth that will set our movement free. And it is the truth that will unite our movement once again. Those that have evidence will be able to come forward. Those that have been unfairly implicated will have an opportunity to clear their names. And we cannot leave this matter unattended. SARS, Ubuti, it is causing problems within our ranks. And we must have the courage to face reality. And we must be prepared to talk about these things openly and honestly, as our forebears did. Those who formed our movement were open, they were honest, and they talked about the difficulties and the challenges that our movement faced very, very honestly and openly. And unless the ANC addresses these challenges, we can be certain, comrades, that our electoral support will continue to slide down. We have research that shows that many ANC supporters did not vote for us in the 2016 elections because of perceptions of factionalism and a sense that we are soft on corruption and that many of our leaders and public representatives were self-serving just looking after themselves. A decline in the ANC's electoral fortunes is not so much about the maturing of democracy as some people have suggested. No, as, as democracies mature, your support will start going down. But we don't accept, as the African National Congress, or what our support should be going down, particularly when we know why our support is going down. Particularly when we know that we are doing certain wrong things ourselves that make our support to go down. So therefore, we need ourselves to correct our ways. If the ANC is voted out of office, 
as happened in several metros in 2016, it will be unable to use state power to continue effective transformation. It is Bukhung comrades to be taken out of power. It is not pleasant. It is the most unpleasant experience. And as we go into 2019, we need now to start looking at whether we are going to win the support of our people. If we continue in the way that we are, I promise you that support is going to continue going down and the ANC could lose power. It will thus lose the most potent weapon that is using state power to build a national democratic society. Now, our country has ex been experiencing a lot of marches across a number of areas in our country. And these marches in various centers are further evidence of the challenge that our movement faces. While it may be true that those who are marching do not reflect the views of the majority of South Africans, many of them nevertheless represent important constituencies that the ANC should be engaging and mobilizing to bring about social and economic change. Throughout its history, comrades, let's remember where we come from. The ANC has been the most effective mobilizer. We were able to mobilize social forces right across the length and the breadth of this country. And today, those forces are being mobilized against us. And that is, can be correct. In fact, we seem to be pushing many important constituencies away from us. People who have always been on our side, we are pushing them away. We now have the uncomfortable situation that broad fronts are now consolidating against us. And we need to ask ourselves, Guti, why have our people turned against us? Through some of our utterances, through some of our conduct, sometimes through sheer neglect, we have alienated many people who we should be organizing and mobilizing. The ANC comrades is meant to unite and not to divide. The ANC is meant to bring everyone together and not to push people away. These marches and associated forms of mobilization present a direct challenge to the ANC's mission to unite all South Africans in pursuit of a better life for all. Unless the ANC acts with determination and a great deal of urgency to address the challenges that we face, the organization is likely to lose further power, further electoral support, but also to lose its ability to lead society in a popular program of change. And in responding to these challenges, the ANC must adhere to its values. The unity that Oliver Tambo spoke of in 1980 was premised on honesty, courage, and principle. It was unity in support of revolutionary ideas. He never envisaged this unity should be used as a cover for misconduct or as a reason not to confront those implicated in wrongdoing. He never saw unity as an excuse to avoid difficult and painful questions that we need to ask ourselves. But even though our movement faces great challenges, and even though our country, comrades, is going through a particularly difficult time, there is every reason to hope. There is reason to hope. There is every reason to expect that the cadence of this movement 
will respond with the same resolve and purpose as they have done before. That they will be imbued with the same determination of Chris Harney when he saw that the ANC was facing serious challenges. He did not run off to join a faction or act in a divisive way. He insisted that the problem must be resolved. I am confident, and many in the leadership of our movement share this confidence, that the branches of our organization will use the upcoming 54th National Conference to chart a new path of principled unity and political and organizational moral renewal. That moment is coming for all of us in December. And comrades, we might have spoken about renewal and so forth in the past. If there ever was a time when this has to be meant in great earnest, if there ever was a time when we've got to act to renew and unite our movement, this 54th conference that is coming in December is going to be that time. And in a way, it will be make or break. Whether we have an ANC going forward that is united or we have a shell of an ANC. Now, this is the seriousness that we need as comrades within the alliance to be focusing on this conference that's coming. We need to come up with clear decisions, clear decisions that are going to make sure that we chart a different path, a path where we will say, rising from that conference, the ANC will have been renewed, the ANC will have gathered new strength as to be able to move to 2019 elections and achieve an overwhelming victory in the 2019 elections. Now, many of the elements of this renewal are to be found in the policy conference docu discussion documents that are currently being debated in our movement. And I would say, comrades, let's spend time going through those policy documents and looking at them closely because the answers to some of the challenges that we are facing are to be found in those documents where we will be able to come up with good policies that will reposition this movement. Good policies that will not only talk about, you know, uh, perceptions of corruption and how we do. Good positions that will say, once corruption is found, it must be rooted out and those who are corrupt must be dealt with severely, as hard as possible. <laughs> Amongst other things, those documents are said that critical to the resolution of the challenges that are facing our movement is the strengthening of internal democracy within the ANC to prevent, to prevent comrades, our branches, our structures being factionalized and being captured, having gatekeepers and being branches that only exist to go to elections and conferences. As we prepare for conference, these current challenges need to be addressed within the ANC's constitutional structures, within the participation of branch members and leaders at all levels. These comrades should not be discussed in factions. They must be discussed in our structures. It, is, it also needs to be a matter for structured and direct engagement with other formations in the alliance as well as broader society, as well as various other formations that subscribe to our policy orientation. Organizations that are on the left, we should engage them as well 
so that we build a broader, much broader movement that is going to result in a national democratic society. The manner of engagement is particularly important. The political culture of the ANC requires that comrades must accept each other's bona fides. They must avoid divisive language and name calling and insulting one another and be prepared to engage honestly with each other's views. A new culture has emerged. It's a culture where we call each other names. Before we even settle down to debate anything, we label, with, we label each other with names. We call, you know, we insult each other. Before we even sit down to debate. And another new culture is set in is that of disrupting meetings, where people just huddle in a corner and disrupt our meetings. That is something that must be rooted out as we are moving to our country. <laughs> Comrades, at a time when there is great distress, even anger inside and outside the movement, it is the responsibility of all cadres to ensure that they are respectful, they are honest, and they are constructive in their engagement. That is how we were taught, that is how we were brought up in the African National Congress. Those are the values that we were breastfed on, and we say those values and that behavior and conduct must continue, particularly as we now move to our conference. This situation, comrades, requires calm heads, clear minds, and sound political judgment. This is a responsibility that rests in great measure on the leadership of our movement and the alliance, but ultimately, it is the duty of each and every one of us to take responsibility for the cohesion and effectiveness of our organization. Each and every one of us needs to understand, as Oliver Tambo, as Chris Honey did, as Ahmed Kathrata did, that in our conduct and in our contribution, we should continue being the glue that holds our movement together. See, bam, in the African National Congress. I remember, comrades, at the 48th conference in 1991, where I was elected Secretary General. Comrade O. R. Tambo, being the outgoing president, gave his political report. And he said, we have brought this movement, we have brought this movement back to our people. We have brought it back bigger and stronger and united. And he said, look after the African National Congress. Now, that's precisely, comrades, what we want to see of every member of the African National Congress, to look after this precious, glorious movement of our people, so that we hold it together, like glue holds substances together. We must weigh every action, every pronouncement we make to ensure that it unites rather than divides. And this also applies to us as leaders, because even us as leaders have been given to standing on platforms and making reckless and irresponsible statements that divide not only our movement but our people as well. The ANC does not divide, the ANC unites, and that is how we want our leaders to act. And we need to constantly ask ourselves, what is it that we must do to build a united and cohesive movement that is honest, that is principled, and that has disciplined members? We need to draw from Chris Harney the lesson that criticism 
of the movement does not mean that one is being disloyal. Oh, comrades, as they were speaking here, some can go out and criticize them and lambast them because they were critical. Criticism in itself does not mean that comrades in the party are being disloyal. They do so because they so love this ANC that they want the ANC to correct itself. That is what they are doing. Criticism cannot be disloyal if it is honest, if it is consistent with the discipline of the movement, and if it is intended to strengthen the movement and promote unity. As we gather comrades to remember comrade Chris Hani, as we ask ourselves, what is it that history demands of us at this difficult moment in our revolution? We must resolve to be the kind of cadre, the kind of leader that Chris Hani was. We must resolve to humble ourselves before our people. To present ourselves before our people without being arrogant, without being haughty, and without being dishonest. Comrade Chris was concerned about issues that, were grap that society was grappling with. Eight days before Comrade Chris was assassinated in April 1993, he was interviewed by a social historian, Ululi Kalinikos. In this interview, on the eve of the 1994 democratic elections, he said that South Africa faced a new enemy and a new struggle and that enemy he said was a socio-economic enemy it was about the struggle for economic empowerment of our people it was a struggle for jobs it was a struggle for houses for social infrastructure and it was going to be a struggle of how we build a society that cares the other issue we have to address in the issue of making sure that we empower our people, yes, economically, is the issue of how we address the land question. The land question in our country has become a real critical issue. And the issue is whether we will address it to fulfill the aspirations that were set out by our people when they drafted the Freedom Charter. When they said the land must belong to those who work it. This issue also directly affects our people here, here in Tina, our people Walanga and at Dispatch. The problem that they are facing has been left unattended to and unresolved for far too long. I remember I came here many, many months ago and they articulated their problem to me. And we then set in place some solutions about how can this be addressed. I am sorry to have heard that this matter till today remains unresolved. I am most unhappy and feel very, very disappointed that this issue has not been resolved. But I will be able to say that the issue that has been put on the table that national departments must now intervene and accelerate that this, the, the solution of this matter is a correct one. And we will attend to it so that our people get services to those areas so that their dignity can be restored. So the matter will be addressed. Now, as we undertake, comrades, the second phase of our transition, in which we must intensify the struggle for socio-economic freedom, we must focus our attention on the actions that are required to confront this new enemy that Comrade Chris spoke about. And some of the challenges are systemic challenges. 
And this is where the party's analysis of the situation that confronts us has been very, very, very sharp and very good. Because the party has said you must go to the root and look at the systemic issues that give rise to all these challenges as you seek to address the triple challenge of unemployment, poverty, and equality in our country. And that we must direct all our resources and energy to achieve much higher rates of growth in our economy and that that growth must be inclusive growth. And we must heed the words of Comrade Chris Hani when he said, I've never wanted to spare myself because I feel there are people who are no longer around and who died for this struggle. What right do I have, Comrade Chris said, to hold back, to rest, to preserve my health, to have time with my family when there are other people who are no longer alive when they have sacrificed what is precious, namely life itself. Comrade Chris Hani, a Sitwalan, say to, gave his life for the freedom of his people. And in order to honor him, it is required that we carry on with this task, the task that he had committed his life so much to. And inspired by his courage and determination and compassion, as we face these challenges, we dare not spare ourselves in the struggle to build a united and free and equal society. And I want to conclude, comrades, by reminding us what Nelson Mandela said when, he laid, when we laid Comrade Chris Hani to rest. He said, we worked together in the National Executive Committee of the ANC. We had vigorous debates and an intense exchange of ideas. You were completely unafraid. No task was too small for you to perform. Your ready smile and warm friendship was a source of strength and companionship. You lived in my home and I loved you like the true son you were. In our hearts, as in the hearts of all our people, you are irreplaceable. We have been struck a blow that wounds so deeply that the scars will remain forever. You lay down your life so that we may know freedom. No greater sacrifice is possible. We lay you to rest with a pledge that the day of freedom you lived and died for will dawn. We all owe you a debt that can only be repaid through the achievement of the liberation of our people which was the passion of your life. Fighter, revolutionary, soldier for peace, we mourn deeply for you. You will remain in our hearts forever. That's what Madiba said when we buried Comrade Tristan. Comrades, the spirit of Comrade Chris Hani will live on if we unite rather than divide. The spirit of Comrade Chris Hani will live on if we work together to destroy the demon of corruption in our ranks. The spirit of Comrade Chris Hani will continue living in our hearts and in our minds if we put the interests of our people above our own personal interests. It is only when we do so as members, 
and as leaders of our movement, that we will be able to repay this huge debt that we owe to Isitwalanwe, Seaparangwe, Chris, Tebisile, Wuhan. We are called upon, therefore, comrades, to live out the values of Chris Hani. We are called upon to try to emulate him as we remember him, to try to be like Chris Hani, and that in everything that we do in our movement, to say, is this what Chris Hani would have done? To ask ourselves, are we living up to his expectations? Because he was a true revolutionary and a true giant of our movement. And today, we know the tasks that lie ahead. Let us start preparing ourselves as we go to the 54th Congress conference to go and correct the African National Congress and reposition it as the true movement of our people. Amanda! Long live the spirit of Chris Hani, long live!